During the Age of Exploration, many explorers of the world would start putting different kinds of new lands on the map, but the last place to be put on our maps is the southernmost Antarctica. Antarctica is cold, vast, and incredibly difficult to live in, but for the usual empires who have already conquered many sandy deserts and icy deserts before, this was just another piece of free real estate. Europe and Antarctica are similar in size, but since Antarctica is uninhabitable, it has one of the lowest population densities in the world. Nevertheless, those Europeans would be the first ones to discover this cold continent and make claims on it, an example that other countries also followed. So how did we get here? Let's talk about that. Britain became the first country to cross the Antarctic Circle in 1773, although they weren't able to reach the continent itself at that point. Instead, they did what Britain does best and colonized a bunch of tiny worthless islands around it, like South Georgia, South Sandwich, the South Hattons, the South Orkneys, the Falklands, Gough, and Tristan da Cunha. Some of these are located closely to the Antarctic Convergence, where the cold Antarctic waters and warm outside waters meet. This is why, despite the close proximity of, for example, the Falklands and South Georgia, the former is a temperate grassland and the latter is a tundra, which is also why the Falklands are populated and South Georgia isn't. So if you're from the Falklands, you should probably subscribe. This is why many of these islands only have strategic importance to Britain. But this is not a science video, so let's get back to history. Now we're in the 1900s, and look at all that cool new stuff we invented. And everyone wanted the slice of the Antarctic cake. And by that I mean literal slices, like, look at this. So a bunch of countries attempted to map out the continent during the so-called Heroic Age of Antarctic Exploration, a very on-the-nose name. After these explorations, Britain claimed all of this land, but today they only claim this part, known as the British Antarctic Territory, which has a very original flag. They laid the borders on the lines of longitude to make the borders clear, but as a result of this, their claims stretch out all the way to the South Pole, and our subsequent claims would consequentially do the exact same thing, creating the not-so-beautiful cake that I mentioned earlier. But hey, at least it makes for the coolest I'm in Britain, I'm in Norway, I'm in New Zealand game ever. You get it? Coolest? Because Antarctica is very... Not to be outdone in the game of empires, France gained a part of the continent in 1924. This is because back in 1840, France used the we place our flag here, therefore it is ours strategy. This phrase is known as Adelie Land, which awkwardly splits Australia's claim into, and it has a very original flag. Now, because Britain, who claimed all of the land at the time, created a compromise with France on the exact borders in 1938, both of them recognized each other's claims. Australia and New Zealand kept that recognition after their independence, and Norway as well, because I guess they don't want to be left out. But this isn't the norm, since all the other countries do not acknowledge any Antarctic assertions. This is because back in 1959, a lot of countries came together to sign the Antarctic Treaty, which basically stated that militaries are cringe, planes are cringe, and science is based. Now, of course, this didn't stop them from still claiming these lands, they'll just have to pretend that they don't. So, France can build their research stations in Adelie land, but that doesn't stop Italy from paying a visit as well. Norway is one of the more unexpected countries that claims a part of Antarctica, because they're pretty much as far away from it as any country could be. I guess that's why they call it polar opposites. But it's actually not too far-fetched. The Norse, especially the Norwegians, have always been exploring the northernmost points of the globe, such as Greenland, where they did some whaling and sealing, which is exactly what they wanted to do around Antarctica as well. During the Antarctic explorations, they were the first to reach the South Pole, and unlike the British, returned home safely. But when Britain started claiming land in Antarctica, Norway wanted to make sure that they wouldn't have to pay any taxes to them for their whaling and sealing. This led to them claiming Peter the First Island and Queen Maud Land, both of which have very original flags. But this claim on Queen Maud Land was contested by, take a random guess, the bad Germany, who claimed this part as New Swabia and based on a bunch of flags. Like what? Do you want us to move the date over? The former British colonies of Australia and New Zealand inherited the Antarctic claims of Britain that they were governing when they became independent. These territories are known as the Australian Antarctic Territory and the Ross Dependency, both of which are very original flags, which I'm sure you've all come to expect by now. The continents of Australia and Antarctica actually have a deeper affiliation than that though. Even the Asian Greeks believed that there existed a continent in the south in order to balance all the land in the north. This idea was especially prevalent during the Age of Discovery. The Spanish explored Tierra del Fuego and the Dutch explored New Holland, pondering if these spaces were perhaps connected with the yet unexplored Antarctica to form one big group hug of continent. This thing is known as Terra Australis. Seem familiar? Yeah, over time, people realized that this thing didn't actually exist after traversing these territories a tiny bit more. So the British, who now own New Holland, decided to change the name of this continent to Australia, because surely there wasn't actually a southern continent after all. Well, that didn't age well, did it? 
So if Antarctica was hypothetically dissolved earlier, then maybe the Australian Antarctic Territory could have been called the New Hollander Australian Territory, which is very weird, so let's move on. Two countries that might not seem imperialistic in a traditional way are Argentina and Chile, both located in the south of South America. What you might notice when glancing at a map of Antarctic claims is this colossal cluster of colors where the claims of Argentina, Chile, and Britain overlap. What's this all about? These two used to be colonies of Spain, before Latin America decided that, that was cringe, so now both of them were independent, and as you may notice, way smaller than their current size. The region to the south is sometimes called Patagonia, and it's very dry and very arid, more so resembling the steppes of Kazakhstan than the moist heart of Argentina. For the time being, it was ruled by the native Mapuche tribes. Spain was never able to conquer them due to both their environment and the tribes themselves. Nevertheless, Argentina and Chile had been claiming this territory all that time thanks to a little thing called the Treaty of Tordesillas. In this treaty, the Pope solved a dispute between Spain and not Spain over the New World, saying this part belongs to Spain and this part belongs to not Spain. So Patagonia was clearly in the Spanish area, and because both Argentina and Chile wanted to outflank the other, the race was on to conquer this land and maybe commit a few atrocities on the way. By the 1880s, this process was done, but those pesky Europeans recently discovered this big chunk of land even further south. And hey, let's just say that this was an extension of Patagonia and the Treaty of Tordesillas. The main problem was that Britain was already there, so the three played a fun game of knocking over each other's flags, until Britain got a little bit distracted and the other two made their move, creating the Chilean Antarctic Territory and Argentine Antarctica, both of which have very... unoriginal flags. Like, come on, how can I enjoy this? There's no Union Jack! Now, they had these three claims that overlapped each other, so what did they do after World War II to fix this problem? Well, that's a good question. Anyways, since these three have signed the Antarctic Treaty, there isn't much they could do to enforce their own claims anymore. Except for that, but we don't talk about that. So those are all the current claims on Antarctica. I suppose we're done here. Oh wait, what, what's that? Marie Burdan is a vast, remote, and completely inhospitable ice desert. Why? Well, don't ask me, this isn't a science video. <sighs> okay, look, it's covered by the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, meaning that it is full of glacier ice, and in this case also below the sea level. It also sits right in between the two biggest ice shelves on the continent, as well as a huge mountain range between those two ice shelves. Not only is it difficult to survive here under these harsh conditions, it's also difficult to even get to. This large piece of land isn't claimed by any major power because it's so impossible to live there. And thanks to the Antarctic Treaty, it likely won't be claimed anytime soon. This is why Marie Burdant is recognized as Terra Nullius, or in other words, a territory that isn't claimed by anyone. Anyone of major significance, at least. The only other territories that are like this are located on the border between Egypt and Sudan, and on the border between Serbia and Croatia. But unlike Marie Bird, those two were created from border disputes, so it's a very special case. Congratulations, Marie Bird. You officially get last place in the game of civilizations. You know, that's a huge feat in its own right. Those are all of the claims in Antarctica, plus the part that isn't claimed. There are also other countries that have reserved the right to make a claim. The US, Russia, Brazil, Peru, Uruguay, and Ecuador. Do these claims matter? No, not really. Hey, hey. Thank you for sticking around until the end. Now, this may be my first video, but I have a lot of ideas for other videos that I want to make. And I know for a fact that the next week I'll upload a video where I redraw the borders of Africa, and the week after that, a video about landlocked countries with navies. And both of those will be in a similar style as this one. So if you like this video, then you can go ahead and subscribe, ring the bell, all that YouTube stuff. And I'll also try to become more comfortable with my English so that closed captions are necessary all the time. But I'm sure that will improve as I release more videos. Alright, see ya.